The feeling of it may at times come sweeping like a gentle tide, pervading the mind with a tranquil mood of deepest worship. It may pass over into a more set and lasting attitude of the soul, continuing, as it were, thrillingly vibrant and resonant, until at last it dies away and the soul resumes its profane, non-religious mood of everyday experience. One of the most profound observations the German theologian Rudolf Otto makes about our experience of the holy is the deep silence that comes over us in response to the sacred. There's this odd tension because silence is not only a response to the sacred, it anticipates the numinous. In other words, it invites us into an experience of the fearful and fascinating mystery. The held breath and hushed sound of the passage, its weird cadences sinking away in lessened thirds, its pauses and syncopations, and its rise and fall in astonishing semitones, which renders so well the sense of awestruck wonder. All this serves to express the mysterium by way of intimation rather than in forthright utterance. Walter J. Ong, a priest and professor, traces the way consciousness changes in the transition from orality to literacy. In this, he acknowledges the participatory nature of each utterance. From his perspective, when we interrupt the silence, we are living. Oral utterance thus encourages a sense of continuity with life, a sense of participation, because it is itself participatory. What follows Ong's declaration here is a question of whether silence is inherently passive or whether it is a kind of action in itself. Our view of man will remain superficial so long as we fail to go back to that origin of silence. So long as we fail to find beneath the chatter of words, the primordial silence, and as long as we do not describe the action which breaks the silence. The spoken word is a gesture and its meaning, a world. For Maurice Mary Ponty, the depth of humanity resides in the invisible. He teaches us that language lives only from silence, that the philosopher knows better than anyone that what is lived is lived spoken, that born at this depth, language is not a mask over being, but if one knows how to grasp it with all its roots and foliation, the most valuable witness to being. Heidegger echoes this when he says language is the house of being. One of the age-old philosophical questions asks us to ponder, does language precede existence or does existence precede language? Marshall McLuhan describes a kind of primordial existence that is outside of time and space. Until writing was invented, man lived in an acoustic space boundless, directionless, horizonless, in the dark of the mind, in the world of emotion, by primordial intuition, by terror. These authors associate silence with origins and beginnings. Rudolf Otto, though, is more interested in what follows the silence. Like Merleau-Ponty and McLuhan, Otto associates silence with darkness and likens silence in music to the mystical effect of semi-darkness that invites a kind of anticipation to what follows. This anticipation prepares us to experience the sacred. The semi-darkness that glimmers in vaulted halls or beneath the branches of a lofty forest glade, strangely quickened and stirred by the mysterious play of half-lights, has always spoken eloquently to the soul, and the builders of temples, mosques, and churches have made full use of it 
silence is what corresponds to this in the language of musical sounds. For Rudolf Otto, the silence speaks. This idea echoes Soren Kierkegaard in one of his lesser-known religious discourses on the lily of the field and the bird of the air. Out there with the bird and the lily, there is silence. But what does the silence express? It expresses respect for God, for the fact that it is He who rules and He alone to whom wisdom and understanding belong. Kierkegaard's passage here informs Otto's starting point in articulating the numinous. There is a deep reverence for God, for the holy, for the sacred. The experience of the numinous starts with a religious humility he calls creature consciousness. It's a feeling not of createdness, but of creaturehood. It's our consciousness of the littleness of every creature in the face of that which is above all creatures. Like Lewis in Virginia Woolf's novel, The Waves, the fearful and fascinating mystery of the holy prompts us to question our existence. Something flickers and dances. Illusion returns as they approach down the avenue. Rippling and questioning begin. What do I think of you? What do you think of me? Who are you? Who am I? That quivers again, its uneasy air over us, and the pulse quickens, and the eye brightens, and all the insanity of personal existence, without which life would fall flat and die, begins again. They are on us. <laughs>